So we're in Augusta in the Imperial Theater. How cool is that? Uh, 98 years young next month, and Charlie Chaplin stood on this stage. Just don't expect me to be Charlie Chaplin. So how do you follow that? Pretty easily. Do you think your biases hold you back? Do you think your biases hold others back? I'm here to tell you positively, without a doubt, yes. Self-awareness has been a theme throughout today, is what I've heard people talk about. Thinking before acting. It is what empowers autonomy. To be a good, autonomous leader, you have to think of other people. You have to think first. You have to decide why you're making the decision you make. Unconscious bias is a filter in which you can react in a way that if you took the time to think through the situation, you may not have made the same decision. So why does the National Security Agency care about unconscious bias? Have you met our adversary? Do you know what we're facing every day to keep this nation safe? An incredible, incredible adversary who wants nothing more than to level us. Now, we've been doing unconscious bias training for our analysis uh, workforce for many years so that the biases that they hold close and dear are not somehow clouding what they're now able to determine our adversary to be able to do or, or their intentions. So we are able today to train our analyst team to be able to figure that out. But what we didn't consider was the impact of unconscious bias on our workforce, on our teammates, we have an incredibly rich demographic across our agency as we look at our succession management plan. All five military services to include the Coast Guard, a contractor workforce from thousands of different kinds of companies, foreign partners and allies, and then add the complexity to that demographic of socioeconomic discussions, politics, male, women, men and women relationships, all those things add intricacy, and we're all in the same workspace trying to fight one adversary who thinks nothing the way we do, doesn't think like us at all. If you want a more tangible of result and you don't believe you have the inside scoop on the National Security Agency, take a look at Silicon Valley. Google, Twitter, Facebook, if you look at the top levels of leaders, what they're discovering is there's not much diversity at the top of those organizations. Why not? Why should you care? For the very reasons we've been having conversations today about ensuring everyone gets an opportunity and we're thinking and considering everyone's potential input to a problem that needs to be solved. That's why you should care. So I'm going to ask you to play a little bit for the next couple of minutes. I'm going to ask you a couple of questions. I ask that you answer them quickly, without thought, based on your first gut reaction, because that's what unconscious bias is. It's your first fight or flight reaction to a question or a decision. Not much thought, just a reaction. So, get a terrorist in your mind's eye, a picture of what that terrorist would look like. Remember that you're terrorists, so when I ask the question, you have the answer. Don't say, I don't know, you know. So, everybody have the terrorists in their mind's eye? If they're male, raise your hand. Okay, put your hands down. If they're of Middle Eastern descent, raise your hand. Okay, put your hands down. If they're younger, 30-ish or younger, raise your hand. Awesome. If they're Muslim, raise your hand. Great, okay. Next round. Get the picture of your favorite doctor, the person you trusted the most in your mind's eye. If they're male, raise your hand. Okay. If they are Caucasian, raise your hand. If they are older, meaning more than 45 years of age, that doesn't mean you're old, raise your hand. <laughs> Don't hold that against me. And then finally, if they're Muslim, raise your hand. 
Okay. So why did we answer those questions the way we did? So I'm going to take you and I ask that you join me on a journey, and I'll use mine as an example. So to understand why Donnie, me, makes the decisions I make, as if you didn't know who, who I was, um, <laughs> if you need to understand where I come from, you need to understand where I come from first. So, I'm from a little town in New Jersey, and by the way, Kim, I'm the voice in the oven. So what does a guy got to do <laughs> to get a light bulb in here, right? So I'm from a little town in New Jersey where the guy next door was the janitor. My father was the body man. And for clarity, because I know who I'm dealing with, that meant he worked on cars. <laughs> the guy across the street was the unionized butcher. There were seven of us, four children, three adults, to include my grandfather in a 750-square-foot, three-bedroom, one-bath rancher, today in Augusta, the size of my bonus room. <laughs> That's the environment that I grew up in. It's where I learned about politics. It's where I learned about religion. It's where I learned about men and women. It is where I learned about the foundation of the things that would affect how I viewed the world. So, down the street were the Italians, we were the Germans, up the road were the Jews. That's how we defined the community, and no one looked any different than I do. That was the foundation under which now I would now begin to assess people in the world as I moved out into it. And so, I joined the Air Force in 1983, and I went into basic training, and found myself in an open bay barracks with 54 other guys from around the country who, oh, by the way, not only didn't sound like me, didn't look like me, didn't have the same belief systems I did, and for the first night, none of us talked to one another. We sat in our, laid in our bunks, eyes open, and you prayed you woke up the next morning. Then we met the guy who would unite us. Awesome guy. To this day, a little nervous when I say this, for fear he may show up somewhere. It was our drill instructor. He was all of five foot seven, and he was the darkest, blackest man I had ever met in my life with eyes to match. And he only had to turn his head in your direction for you to, I'll be polite and say cry. <laughs> so I began to see the world differently because he united 54 people from around the country in a way we would have never talked and worked and partnered together had he not been there. And in that, we began to be self-aware and discover that people were not who we thought they were. The belief systems we were raised to believe about certain people with certain skin tone or certain religious backgrounds began to be questioned. So fast forward 10 years into my career, and I'm selected to go to this incredible assignment at the Defense Language Institute in Monterey, California, an institute where all of the languages from Arabic, Farsi, Russian, German, Chinese, Vietnamese are taught for the Department of Defense. I'm going to be a faculty member. I'm pretty excited and a little bit arrogant at the time. They handpicked me to join an organization that was made up of all civilians. They had never had a military person in the organization before. And so I went there believing I was all that and a bag of chips. And I found myself the minority on every single level that I had ever experienced in my life. I didn't have a bachelor's, I only had a high school diploma. The lowest degree that I had that was in that room that day was a PhD. The person that sat next to me was Russian, from Russia, right? Not like I was German and that was my heritage, from Russia. <laughs> East Germany, Norway, Turkey, Poland, Yugoslavia, Jersey. I was out of my element and a little insane, right? So I went to my first staff meeting uh, and I asked one question because we were going to begin to teach courses that certified instructors at the Defense Language Institute, DLI. Uh, could I have a copy of the lesson plans that we would use to teach people to teach foreign language? And I was met by the woman from East Germany who said to me quite plainly, and I'll paraphrase, laughing, pointing and laughing, said, I kind of figured you would come with no substance of your own 
and you'd have to rely on other people's materials to be able to teach the course. So it was the first moment of adulthood in my life where I refrained from my Jersey roots that wanted to leap across that table and grab her by her throat and take her outside to the swing set. So I didn't do that because I had been pre-warned by my boss not to, because he knew they were going to evoke something. And I thought to myself, for the first time, by the way, <laughs> 29 years old, maybe she has a right to think that of me. Right? Maybe she has experiences with people like me, a Westerner in a uniform, uh, that were not great. So maybe she has a moment where I'll give her that. So I told her, you have six months. If in six months I'm not, we'll go forward. In six months she became, and to this day still is, one of my strongest mentors. Fed me, helped me, saw in me things I didn't see in me. We learned about learning styles, and that was the beginning of the self-awareness, another level of that self-awareness, where I understood how I learned best and how I could use that to improve my language capability, which for the first time became fluent. In 10 years. And then I discovered it wasn't just about me, Thank you, Elizabeth. It wasn't just about me, it was about others. When I taught, I taught in the style in which I learned, which may not have been compatible for you, so I had to think about you. That's a first. I had to begin to think of others before I made choices and decisions. And that leads me to today. NSA started a journey about a year ago. Admiral Rogers, the new director of the National Security Agency, commander of US Cyber Command, Deputy Director of Central Security Service, many hats, decided he was going to pluck a senior executive. When I say senior executive, like a four-star general, a CEO of a company, out of the core to lead a special emphasis program on equality, because he too began to look at his organization like a high-tech organization and discovered there wasn't a lot of diversity at the top. And we began this exploration of unconscious bias and triggers. Deborah Plunkett was our new senior advisor, and she hit the ground running having studied this across the IT world. What she found was that the good old boy network, and you know the one I'm talking about, everybody looks like me, and we make sure we keep ourselves at the forefront. What she found is that network was bigger than she imagined, and oh, by the way, it wasn't all people who look like me. If you don't think I'm telling the truth, let's talk about a couple of studies that I found uh, from Dr. Kieran Snyder, a CEO of a company called Textio. So Textio developed a software that could analyze your job announcements for genderized language. What people were noting was that if I put something in my job announcement that said, passion for learning, the number of women applicants was higher than the number of men. So language began to select and create applicant pools that we were unaware of. So she decided, because she had met one of her longtime friends and a very successful woman in the IT world, that she would ask her for her resume, and she did. She was unimpressed by this highly professional, highly successful, high-tech IT professional female and said she wouldn't have hired her based on that resume. So she collected about 1,000, close enough to be equally distributed across men and women in the IT world, from junior to higher ranks, across many companies to include government sector. Here's what she found. Women's resumes were 41% more wordy, higher level narratives, more strategic in nature. Men's were more pointed, bulletized, verb, impact. And here's the kicker. When it came to the hiring decision, it didn't matter whether that hiring manager was a man or a woman, they were more likely to pick, to pick the man's resume. She experienced it herself when she looked at her colleague's resume and said she wouldn't hire her based on that. Now, this isn't to say, go back and rewrite your resumes. This is a cue for hiring managers who are making decisions in an unconscious way that need to step back and consider they need both those elements in their team. Diversity is critical for success. And I say it and I mean it, because if you look at our adversary, if you look at the people who want to take us down, we can't be who we are, we have to understand who they are. 
She did another survey. She looked at review, feedback time after an evaluation process. Took 180 reviews, uh, 180 people provided 248 reviews. Bottom line was this, and we've heard this term. If I use the word aggressive to describe a woman in a workplace, we all know the translation. If I use it to describe a man, that means that they're aggressive and goal-oriented and results-driven. That was what the survey showed. Again, when it came back to feedback, it didn't matter whether it was a man or a woman providing the feedback, it was the same. Men got concrete, constructive feedback with little to no negative in that, where women not only got constructive, negative feedback, they got behavioral feedback. You need to give people space. You need to step back. You need not to be so aggressive. And so the answer to this is not for people to change necessarily who they are, be aware of who they are, but for of supervisors and people making employment decisions to know why they're making the choices they're making and understand the implication. Very critical. As we move forward, we need to be able to do that. So, getting back to the polls. As I looked across the hands, majority picked men. That's a gender bias that we all hold or we've grown up with and because it's what we experience. Um, and only I could see the hand, so you'll have to trust me. Unless you looked around, and I'll talk to you later. Um, and then there was uh, the age difference, right? So age plays a factor in what you're expecting people to be and to be able to do. If we looked at the, at the most current terrorist event in this country in San Bernardino, no one thought it would be an American first, and he was an American first. And second, no one believed that there could be a woman who could do that activity. We've seen them where they strap bombs, but never as a part of the gunmen in the activity. So they broke paradigms and biases for us. And then in 1995, when I was at the Defense Language Institute, the Oklahoma City bombing occurred. And everybody looked to the Arab community as the fault. And it was a person who looked like me. What I'm asking you to do is begin your journey of self-exploration. Know who you are, learn who others are, appreciate who they are, and be awake and conscious about your decisions. Thank you. <clears throat>